Welcome to the first lecture in classical mechanics. The topics that we will explore in this lecture include a brief history of physics from its pre-scientific origins to the foundational science that it is today. We will look at the role that a theory plays in science, and we will look at fundamental physical quantities and how to measure those quantities. Physics has its roots in natural philosophy which is the philosophical study of nature and the physical universe. Natural philosophy relied on observations of nature and pure reason to explain those observations. Most explanations were qualitative in nature and applied only to a specific kind of object or kind of matter. Further, these explanations were not required to be testable or make predictions. They were considered to be self-evident. This stands in stark contrast to scientific explanations. The most enduring tenets of natural philosophy were put forth by the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who lived sometime between 384 and 322 BCE. His ideas were not seriously challenged until the 17th century CE. Aristotle's lectures on nature is composed of eight books attempting to describe and explain matter and change. This collection is known as the physics. However, I want to caution that the meaning of the word physics as used in this context is very different from its meaning today. To Aristotle, motion or change is a defining characteristic of nature. And there are as many kinds of motion as there are kinds of being. This referred to both living and non-living objects. Over time, these different kinds of motion were classified as one of two general types terrestrial and celestial, that is, the objects on the earth and the objects in the heavens. To Aristotle, the natural state of a terrestrial object is to be at rest upon the earth, while the natural state of a celestial object is to be in constant circular motion about the earth. Further, each motion, whether natural or contrary to nature, requires a cause, what would later be known as a force of motion. For a terrestrial object, the natural affinity of the object, which is of the earth, to its kind, keeps the object at rest. This is an application of the principle, like attracts like, which is a very ancient occult principle that is still in circulation today. And a terrestrial object, which is set in motion by a force, will come to rest once that force is removed. So let's look at the self-evident explanations for the motion of a terrestrial object. The natural state of a terrestrial object is to be at rest upon the earth, and the cause for this motion is the natural affinity of the object to the earth. And in order for this object to have a state of motion that is contrary to its nature, a force must be applied. And once that force is removed, the object is once again at rest upon the earth. Now observe this type of motion. Once again, now the intuitive notion of a force is a push or pull that requires some type of physical contact with the object. And so for that last observation of motion, it may have occurred to you to ask what kept the object in motion for that finite amount of time when there was no physical contact with the object. Proponents of Aristotle would argue that it was the memory of the applied force. This was especially their explanation for why an arrow stays in flight once it leaves the bow. Now, for a celestial object, the natural affinity of the object to its kind keeps the object in motion. This is once again an application of the occult principle, like attracts like. Further, celestial objects were thought to move in an essentially circular orbit about the Earth in one direction. And then we observe the apparent retrograde motion of the planet Mars, which from the vantage point of the Earth appears to change direction. To explain this away, planets were then proposed to move in epicycles on a main circular orbit about the Earth, where the smaller the epicycle, the less pronounced the retrograde motion. So to summarize Aristotle's physics, Motion is specific to kinds of being. Eventually, this led to two general classes, terrestrial versus celestial. 
Motion requires a cause, and we arrive at this self-evident truth through pure reason. Now, one of the first to challenge Aristotelian and Ptolemaic ideas was the mathematician and astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, who lived from 1473 to 1543. His On the Revolution of Celestial Spheres, which was published very shortly before his death, argued that all planets, including the Earth, orbit the Sun, and that mathematics, rather than philosophy, is the proper tool to understand celestial motion. Unfortunately, Copernicus's heliocentric model retained the Ptolemaic epicycles and was largely suppressed by the Catholic Church. Surprisingly, there are still adherents of geocentrism today. A fellow YouTuber that I would highly recommend is Cool Hard Logic. In particular, his series Testing Geocentrism is both informative and entertaining. I'll put a link to his channel in the description below. Now, one person who embraced the Copernican model was Johannes Kepler, who lived from 1571 to 1630. Kepler discovered three laws of planetary motion based on very careful measurements by the observational astronomer Tycho Brahe. Among his laws, the first is that all planets move in elliptical orbits with the Sun at one focus. Now, while his laws were derived for orbits around the Sun, they also apply to satellite orbits as well. The science of physics essentially began with the Italian astronomer Galileo, who lived from 1564 to 1642. Galileo has been called the father of science, the father of physics, and the father of modern observational astronomy. Galileo insisted on experimental observations supported by careful measurements to validate a claim about nature. This is the core of the scientific method. It is not enough to think something is true, you must be able to demonstrate it is true with empirical evidence. Galileo improved the refracting telescope and with his telescope made observations that supported the Copernican heliocentric model. In particular, Galileo observed that the planet Venus had phases very similar to the Moon and this suggested that the planet Venus, at least, orbited the Sun rather than the Earth. As many of you know, Galileo's support of the Copernican theory landed him in serious trouble with the Catholic Church, and he was forced to publicly recant his opinions. He was then placed under house arrest for the remainder of his life, and all his writings, including those he might write in the future, were banned. It was while he was under house arrest that Galileo wrote his Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations Relating to Two New Sciences, which took the form of a dialogue between three main characters. A debt of gratitude is owed to the Netherlands, where the church had little power, and in particular to Ludovic Elzevert of the renowned Dutch publishing family who published Two New Sciences. The Two New Sciences, referred to in the title, are a study of the strength of materials and motion, in particular what we now know as kinematics, Galileo's study of motion included what we now know as momentum and the law of falling bodies. Now, in science, a law is an empirical statement that is derived from experimentation, asserting a direct relationship between two or more physical quantities. Most scientific laws take the form of a mathematical equation, and a law has a range of validity outside of which it is not applicable. So let's look at the law of falling bodies discovered by Galileo. Now through a series of very careful experiments, Galileo was able to demonstrate that the time required for an object to fall a vertical distance r is directly proportional to the square root of that distance r so that the distance that an object falls is proportional to the square of the time. And in fact, the ratio of that distance to the 
square of the time was always a constant, which we'll call k, so that the time required for the object to fall a distance r is the square root of r divided by that constant k. Now today, we know that this constant k is exactly one-half g, where g is the acceleration due to gravity, and so the time required for an object to fall a vertical distance r is equal to the square root of two times that distance r divided by g. Notice in particular that this expression does not depend on mass. And this is a very non-intuitive fact that contradicted the Aristotelian view. So this law states that two objects of different masses that are dropped from the same vertical distance from the ground will reach the ground at the same time. Now recall that a law has a range of validity outside of which it is not applicable. And this law holds exactly in a vacuum where there is no air resistance to impede the fall of objects and holds approximately near the surface of the Earth for objects that are not affected so much by air resistance. We can demonstrate this law today with uh, objects of very different masses and shapes, but this law was very famously demonstrated during the Apollo 15 mission to the moon. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Oh, okay. I have a, a good picture there. Be I've got the beautiful picture, Dave. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather. In my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, it proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Now, I want to point out that Galileo made a tacit assumption about the nature of time that was followed by all of his successors up into the work of Albert Einstein. And that is, time is essentially linear, and the flow of time is essentially constant. The first colossus of physics, Isaac Newton, lived between 1642 and 1727. Newton was born the same year that Galileo died. Newton's Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, which was first published in 1687, consisted of three books. Two later editions were published during his lifetime in 1713 and 1726. This monumental work, generally referred to by a single word from its Latin title, Principia, contains Newton's Three Laws of Motion, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, and a derivation of Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. The Principia finally and completely relegated Aristotle's physics to an historical anecdote. In particular, Newton's laws of motion and law of universal gravitation applies to all objects, whether they be terrestrial or celestial, as is illustrated in the following clip from the PBS Nova series, The Elegant Universe, based on the book by the physicist Brian Greene. In an audacious proposal for his time, Newton proclaimed that the force pulling apples to the ground and the force keeping the moon in orbit around the earth were actually one and the same. In one fell swoop, Newton unified the heavens and the earth in a single theory he called gravity. The unification of the celestial with the terrestrial, that the same laws that govern the planets in their motions govern the tides and the falling of fruit here on Earth. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, 
unification of our picture of nature. Now recall that a law states a direct relationship between two or more physical quantities that can be observed and measured. A law does not explain why this relationship is observed. In science, a theory is an explanatory and predictive model of a natural phenomenon that is tested and confirmed through observation and experimentation. So a theory explains observations, including empirical laws, and makes predictions about future observations. Newton called the observable phenomenon that physical bodies with mass attract one another gravity. In physics, a force is any interaction that can change the motion of an object, and this includes either its speed or direction of motion. And so the force of gravity is the gravitational interaction between objects with mass that can change the motion of one or all of the objects. Newton's law of universal gravitation is an empirical statement regarding the strength or magnitude of the force of gravity. Newton's law of universal gravitation states that the strength or magnitude of the gravitational force between two objects with mass m1 and m2 is directly proportional to the product of those masses and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance r between the centers of mass of those objects and that the force of gravity acts on a line connecting the centers of mass of those objects. However, the law does not explain how gravity arises. Now, Newton's second law of motion states that the ratio of the total force applied to an object to the mass of that object is equal to the acceleration of the object. In symbols, we have the force applied to the object divided by the mass of the object equals the acceleration of the object. Now Newton's second law applies to the gravitational force, and so we have the gravitational force on an object divided by the mass of that object is equal to the acceleration due to gravity. Now we can replace the numerator on the left-hand side with the expression from Newton's law of universal gravitation where the force is directed towards the object of mass capital M. And so we have a simplified expression that is independent of the mass of the given object. But how does that expression explain the gravity that we observe on and near the Earth? And how does that expression predict the behavior of an object that is close enough for gravitational interaction with the Earth? Now, the expression predicts that as the distance of a given object from the center of mass of the object of mass capital M becomes increasingly large, the acceleration due to gravity of the given object becomes zero, and this agrees with experimental observation. The expression also predicts that the acceleration due to gravity of the given object is independent of its mass. This also agrees with experimental observation. Further, the expression predicts that near the surface of the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity is essentially constant, since in this case, the distance r between the object and the center of mass of the Earth is essentially constant. Once again, this agrees with experimental observation. Now, if we use this expression to attach to every point in the space about the object of mass capital M, a vector with magnitude equal to the expression that is directed radially towards the object of mass capital M, then we have a mathematical construct called a vector field. This mathematical model is essentially the Newtonian theory of gravity. It is a model that explains how gravity arises. In particular, nature behaves as though a massive object creates a gravity field in the space surrounding it. Further, this model has predictive power that agrees with experimental observations.